to be in those more mature, dense, you know, unburned forests. So it is one of the reasons mixed severity is so important in a lot of these places is that it's creating an area where you have all these different habitats right next to each other. You may have some species that they like to forage in high severity burn areas. They're you know, foraging for those deer mice that are really increasing population or they're um, foraging for something else. You know, maybe it's uh, they're foraging for insects that are coming in for the pollinating or for the uh, flowering shrubs that come in afterward. But they like to nest in a lower severity burned area. So um, that, that's where you can have these edge species do really well. And if you want to learn more about that specifically uh, and really just about fire and forest in general. This is a must read. I always put this on my must read list. I send this to everyone I know when they ask me questions about fire. It came out last year, uh, probably the best example of um, science journalism I've ever read. It's just so, so good. And I will, um, I can, maybe someone can send it out uh, as a link, but it's really good. It's from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It's in their uh, Living Bird magazine publication, but they have it published on All About Birds. Uh, and it's by a guy who um, did his graduate research on this topic and then became a, a science journalist and is one of their editors. Uh, really, really wonderful piece. Highly, highly recommend. And I'll just sort of end with, you know, if you've taken away anything, I hope it's that fire is really nuanced. It's complex. It doesn't always do the things that we think it's supposed to do or nature doesn't do the things that we sometimes think it's supposed to do. There's still a lot of misconceptions. I'm only barely scratching the surface on a lot of uh, the issues out there. I wanted to show you more of the uplifting side of post-fire uh, landscapes because we just had a pretty serious fire year. And I have this feeling that there are a lot of people out there who are worried that their favorite places are lost, you know, their, their moonscape, they're gone forever. Um, but just know that the next several years in those places are gonna be pretty enchanting, pretty magical. Um, especially in the forest and the post-fire forested areas. It is a great time to go see really unique bird species. If you want to see lazuli buntings, which I don't see very often outside of burned areas, this is a good example of a place. I mean, I've, I've seen more lazuli buntings in this spot uh, in the springs after this Thomas fire um, than anywhere else uh, that I've ever uh, been. So there's a lot to love about these places and there's a lot to be hopeful for. Uh, and I know that is tough in a year like 2020 when it feels like there's a lot more to be sad about and to be um, upset about. But I highly recommend trying to visit some of these post-fire areas. Uh, you gotta be really careful as you're walking through them, especially if there's like poodle log bush, you don't wanna get a rash, but you also wanna be careful that you're not um, disrupting the ecosystem. You don't wanna be bringing in non-native plants. You wanna clean your boots before you go into these places. And you wanna be very careful where you step. Uh, and you wanna also be careful because soil shifts, rocks shift in these places. Uh, I've taken many a tumble uh, in these post-fire areas, um, especially right after the fire. And uh, you know, so I do urge caution, but it's a, it's a rewarding experience. So that's all I have. I know that was really long. I apologize uh, for it being so long, but I really wanted to pack all this information in. If you wanna follow Forest Watch, you can go check out our website. We've got a lot of great info on there. We do a lot of advocacy work. You can check us out on Facebook, um, Instagram. You can check me out on Instagram, like Kristen, earlier. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, I do a lot of educational posts. Um, I tried to not include so much that I've already done on Instagram in this presentation because I wanted you to see some new things. If you if you go back and check out my, my gram, uh, you can go back and learn some other cool stuff uh, if you go back and some of my older posts. So um, that's it. Brian, that's all I've got. Yep. Brian, thank you so much. I know that um, you know the downside, I've said this to previous speakers as well, the downside to this format is that you can't hear the applause and also the laughter. I think that it's probably overwhelming. I definitely chortled <laughs> a couple times. Hey, I'm glad to hear yeah. it, yeah. We have actually, uh, as our um, San Luis Obispo chapter on our swag, we have the San Luis Obispo Lupin. So I think I chortled hey, at P head right. is perfect. So I think we just need to add that to our t-shirts. Hey, I'm, I'm telling you, there's uh, there's so many opportunities for those those um, plant nerd, you know, quips and puns. Uh, plant nerds, I've realized, are um, very nerdy. So uh, I think we're all in good company. Yeah, yeah, and I know you're seeing the chat right now, so you don't have to take it from me. I think everyone appreciated this, so the the applause, the inaudible applause, are are overwhelming. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks everyone um, for coming. I really appreciate all the questions, and and feel free if you have more questions. I'm happy to stick around as long as the, the you know uh, 
uh, Kristen yeah. and Melissa are happy to stick around. I, I can answer questions all night if you want me to. Um, <laughs> But uh, and I know I did. I, again, I can't stress enough. I just scratched the surface on a lot of this stuff, and uh, you know, I hopefully after COVID, the COVID crazy times end one day. Hopefully they end. Um, we can maybe do like some joint hike together into a you know post fire yeah. area. Uh, I I actually just started this year a fire hike series uh, before COVID started, and it was growing. It was going really well, and I think people learn a lot from being out on the ground. Yeah. That would be wonderful. Um, I think that our chapter would love to host you for a little, a little outing, a little hike as soon as we can all do that again safely. Um, um, we do have a couple questions in the queue if we wanted to start looking at those and people can add more if they think of them. Yeah, I see Jeff's, I see Jeff's question. Um, how does a shorter than normal fire interval impact obligate resprouters? That's a great question. Um, it's it's one that we don't know as well as the obligate cedar effect. And what we do know is that they can be squeezed by short fire return intervals. Eventually you do, if you get them short enough, um, you will just get rid of chaparral entirely and it will be replaced with just native uh, non-native grasses and weeds uh, like mustard and, and uh, bromus or uh, wild oats. With obligate resprouters, they do need some time between fires because they are, when they resprout, they're taking all these carbohydrate stores that they've been um, building up in their root systems or their burls, and they're pumping all this into this growth. And they need to replenish that before the next fire. They also need some time uh, usually to be able to start putting out seed again um, so that they can start repopulating from seed. And they're, again, remember that their seedlings are killed by the fire. Uh, so their seedlings can start coming up as soon as they start reproducing. But if you get a fire coming in through too soon, not only will you wipe out any new individuals in the population, um, especially if you did, you know, plants can die from fire, even if they can resprout. Sometimes it just happens. Um, and so you want to have that, that new growth from seed as well, you know, years after the fire. Uh, and if that gets wiped out, then you may be setting the population back, you know, bit by bit with each recurring fire. Um, so you really... I always say in chaparral, especially, the longer it goes unburned, the better, because you're building up that seed bank, you're allowing vegetation uh, to build up so that the fire can be hot, nice and hot. Um, you're also uh, allowing for nice canopies to develop to shade out invasive plants. Uh, and these resprouting species are able to put carbon back in their, in their root systems. All right. Um, let me see here. I'm going to try to manage oh, the, these. What the happened? highway, the highway 41 fire. Um, Steve just mentioned that. Yeah, that's you know on East Quest or West Quest Ridge. Still, I mean, it's been what that was back in '94. Uh, you know, we're we're talking almost three decades since that fire. Still, an amazing place to go see some of these um, some of these concepts, uh, especially Sergeant Cypress. Hands down, best place to go see Sergeant Cypress, in, in my opinion, in California. Um, and you can see how it came up after the fire. It's really wonderful. Uh, highly, highly recommend checking out the Cuesta, Cuesta uh, Ridge Botanical Area. Uh, great place to see the effects of the Highway 41 fire uh, on that landscape. Yeah, Brian, when I was chatting with you uh, to invite you to this talk, you probably recall, I was just getting ready to do a through hike from West Cuesta to Cerro Alto, and I ended up doing that. It was it was a wonderful hike. I don't know if anyone awesome. here on the, on the talk has done that hike, but it was about 14 miles, and it, it was awesome. Yeah, you get to see um, yeah the Sergeant Cypress, the Coulter Pines. There's some Coulter Pines up there. The what the Bishop Manzanita isn't that one of the, the rare species mm -hmm. up there? Yeah, God, it's such a cool place. One of my favorite things about Cuesta Ridge is um, it's where you can find. Golden fleece. I love golden fleece, uh, Erythromeria yeah. arborescens, and that's where I feel like it gets its scientific epithet. You know, it's um, that it's, it's scientific name, arborescens. It's, it's very tree-like, right? And right. I think that is a great place to see that in action. It tends to be growing up above the rest of the chaparral, uh, and, it, and it looks like these weird little trees kind of dotting the landscape. And, and when they bloom in like September, it's just a beautiful, beautiful sight. So yeah, big fan of Erythromeria over here, obviously. Um, yeah, and, and you know, I went is it, and I, is it a favorite? <laughs> it's a favorite. It's, it's definitely a favorite. Um, yeah, I, I can't. I'm a sucker for golden fleece. It's a, I believe it's a facultative cedar. Uh, it definitely comes up really prolifically from seed after a fire. 
Uh, I didn't show any photos of that, except for, I guess, the rim fire. It, you know, I, I imagine that was coming up from a dormant seed bank or, or something. I'm not really sure, actually. Uh, so again, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to still explore, a lot of research to, to do. Um, one thing I was going to say, I was up on East Cuesta Ridge this weekend. It was a little bit spur of the moment um, trip, or I would have I would told you, Kristen, uh, I know oh, you yeah. offered to, to go hiking together, but uh, I actually saw Kieran, I don't know if he's still in here. I saw Kieran uh, up there looking at Manzanitas. Um, so that was cool. kind of a cool, small world. I saw I saw him with his Manzanita book and, um, you know, looking at Manzanitas on, on the side of a road. I was like, uh, this is a plant nerd right here. I'm going to, I'm going to chat with this person. So you just, you just met him on that hike? You didn't know him before? No, no, yeah. And, you know, we just talked for a little bit. I don't know if he's still, if you're he, still around here. I just tried oh, yeah. to hi, nice, hi, hi nice, Karen. <laughs> was nice. Yeah, oh, hey, hey there. Yeah, nice meeting you. Uh, hope you guys had some good botanizing fun that day. Uh, we continued on and really explored the, um, the Knobcone Pine stands. That was, it's so cool to see. You just don't get those uh, down in my area. So that was really fun to see those big stands that came up after the, um, that was the 85, that was the Las Palitas fire, I believe. Uh, and I found the culture pines still. Um, yeah, so it was really, it was really cool. So thank you for, you, you pointed me in the right direction, of uh, some culture pines, um, which it was just to follow the ridge, but it, good directions. Thank you, Kieran. Cool, that's awesome. Um, well, I think, so there's two questions here queued up in the chat. And I think Jeff's oh, sure. question you actually answered in, I just didn't dismiss it yet because I wasn't sure, but I think you answered that during the presentation. Um, I think it was okay. Monday, you're, you're right. I didn't. I didn't see Corey's question. Um, Jeff's question. I think I did answer that. Yeah. A lot of those. It's 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 just a little confusing because it's hard to tell exactly where that seed is coming from. It's definitely being. It's coming from surviving plant. You know, it's trees nearby. Uh, it's just whether or not they're coming from the tree right next to them, you know, that happened to survive in that patch, or if it's coming from an entirely different patch that burned at low severity. Uh, it's hard, it's hard to tell. Um, but in areas like when we see high severity patches that are, you know, several hundred acres in size, and you find conifers growing in the middle of them, those are coming from an, um, some, you know, moderate severity or low severity patch on the edge somewhere. Uh, and that's why a lot of times you'll see conifer regeneration will happen kind of from the outside in, in these patches. Um, so that inner area will tend to be the shrubbiest for the longest, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, so it goes back to that kind of complexity of habitat structure uh, and forest structure, which is, is pretty cool. Now, Corey's question, you asked me, uh, is invasive mustard uh, seed killed by fire events? That is a great question. Yes, it can be. Same with any uh, invasive plant that isn't really well adapted to like high heat from a fire. The problem is, if you have an area with a lot of mustard and a lot of like wild oats, for example, which I know you have around San Luis Obispo, yeah. when those start to develop really big stands and they're out, they've outcompeted the shrubs and the other native plants, they start to develop a thatch layer that can be pretty resistant to fire. So fire will come through really quickly and, and pretty cool, um, you know, temperature wise. And it won't even really penetrate that thatch layer all the way sometimes, or that thatch layer will burn up, but it is just cool enough and just quick enough that it's not getting to the seed underneath. Uh, mm. it's not falling it. That's why it can be so problematic to have these short interval fires in these areas, because it creates a feedback loop. Whereas you have shorter fires and you lose more native species, you have more competition from the invasive species that come in afterward. And then they start to create conditions that favor those faster, cooler fires that make it more, you know, make it easier for them to continue thriving there. Uh, so we sometimes we call that like the grass fire cycle or the grass fire feedback loop. Uh, it applies with mustard as well. Um, so it's one of the reasons why you will see like an area around slow that is nothing but mustard and wild oats and ferns. And you see it a few years later and it's all wild oats and mustard still. That's the reason. Um, fire doesn't just cure an existing problem necessarily. Uh, I do say though, fire is sometimes a great, um, you know, when it burns like these beard dense plantations that are planted in rows and they're all the same species, like out in uh, forested areas and we have tons of plantations all over the place. Uh, I look at fire as sort of a restorative, um, you know, uh, a disturbance that occurs in those systems, uh, especially when it's like higher severity fire, because it's going to cause regrowth to happen naturally and if you don't come in and salvage log it and replant it in rows, um, what's gonna come back is gonna be more of a natural forest structure 
so I look at fire as, um, yeah, as a as kind of the great the great um, equilibrator, I guess you could call it for for some of these areas that are already a little bit messed up. Um, but yeah, the grasses and the the weeds, fire doesn't always do the trick, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, uh, Bryant, just I wanted to say. Thank you so much for, you know, your presentation. I thought your photographs were beautiful and everything. And Thanks. I certainly enjoyed it. And you got all kinds of kudos in the comments section. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for attending and being in a captive audience. Um, yeah. I think yeah, this was you. great. And thanks, Kristen, for uh, bringing Bryant on. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you really nailed it when we talked. Um, I, we were right kind of in the midst of, of, or at the tail end of some of those really bad fires. And, right. and I just really wanted, um, I just wanted to address it. You know, I wanted someone that like you knows what you're talking about. You're in the thick of it. Clearly you're visiting these fires um, and to just bring, to shed some light and, you know, a little hope because good things do come after the fire and, and you really nailed it. So thank you. I really hope everyone appreciated it as much as I did. That was lovely. Well, thank you. It was great being here. I'm really glad we connected and um, uh, hope to keep, you know, working together and uh, hopefully we can, can do some joint hike in the future. But um, yeah, thanks again to everyone. Thank you for all the questions and uh, happy to provide my, my perspective on, on these things. And uh, Feel free to get in touch. My email, I'll just put in the chat for those who are still sticking around in case you want it. Uh, it's uh, bryant at lpfw.org. Um, feel free if you want to chat more, happy to talk, uh, happy to send you guys my slides if you need them. Um, yeah, so thank you. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks again, and thanks everybody, and I guess happy holidays. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.